Welcome, folks. We're going to start another Washington County Public Affairs Forum, uh, and I want to welcome Adam, Mike, and Tanya from NIWA, the uh, Northwest Independent Writers Association. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to recognize something uh, uh, that just occurred last Friday in the community, and that uh, Chief Hoffman from Twalton Valley Fire and Rescue just celebrated and retired from 27 years of service. And they had a remarkable event over at the North Command Center. And uh, uh, he has been very gracious to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum by allowing us to store our archives at the North Command Center and allowing public information officers to come out and visit and participate in our programs. Uh, another person I want to recognize is uh, Bill Kroger. He's going to be assisting us with uh, some forum history. If you go to WashingtonCountyForum.org, you're going to see a couple changes. Uh, Gary Olson, who was our webmaster for a number of years, is still in, in the background and assisting me. And we have uh, compiled and replaced some information on that website where we have history starting in 1956 at the origination of this organization. Some of the past presidents and the people involved in the Washington County Forum have gone on to be the governor. We've hosted legendary debates. And the forum history is something that, as we approach our 60th anniversary, is something I, as president, want to make sure is not only well documented and well represented. So the forum now, the forum's website now contains a lot of history and additional information that you may find uh, uh, fun to go back and take a look at because we are the forum of record. And this is where epic debates such as uh, Bonamici versus Cornelis and uh, many other ones have occurred. And we've uh, proven to be influencing uh, of the, uh, the public record. I want to close with uh, one instance of that. Uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, the uh, publication known as Willamette Week decided to fact check uh, the uh, Nina Cook, Judge Baldwin, Supreme Court race. And they did that by looking at our video. And I want to just remind you that uh, we not only audio but video record these programs, and they are of benefit to folks for decades to come. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here. And I would like to ask that you uh, give a round of applause for Adam, Mike, and Tanya from NIWA. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. I'm Mike Chinakis. I'm the author of the Hollywood Cowboy series, and my current novel is a sci-fi short story collection called Terminal Horizons. I am a co-founder of the Nor Northwest Independent Writers Association, and I am also the past president. Uh, to my left here is Adam Copeland, who is also the co-founder. He is the author of uh, Echoes of Avalon, and he is currently working on his next ser series. He is also now the current president of NIWA. To my right is Tanya Macalino. She is uh, the author of, what, I forget the series name, I always go by the titles. There you go, we got <laughs> specters of attention and faces in the water. Uh, she is the current vice president, and we're going to be here to talk to you a little bit today about what NIWA is about, what we do, and what we have done in the past, and what we are going to do in the future. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and Tanya both to tell you a little bit uh, about what NIWA is, and go over a little bit about what our mission is here in the community. Hi, I'm Adam Copeland. I am the current president, and I'm the one who's currently helping move us forward with our plans. Every February, we get together and we plan for what we're going to do in the next year. And this last year, we had wanted to become one, an official business, as opposed to just a club of people who got together and commiserated. And we were hoping to be a nonprofit status this year as well, but we wanted to take our time getting to that status and uh, make sure we did it right. So that's going to be an agenda item for this next coming year that Tanya will be responsible for <laughs> making sure it happens properly. Uh, so what is NIWA? NIWA is a group of people. It's like a farmer's market of independent writers. And unfortunately, independent writers, by and large, currently have a sort of a stigma against them in that they're not quite real authors. That's not true, and we are looking to remove that stigma by providing an environment where indie authors can come together, share resources, help each other out to achieve professional quality, have a community to commiserate, and then find markets and outlets to share their stories and show the world that their work is just as professional as everybody else's. And in a nutshell, that's what we do, and we have a lot of different programs that Tanya will um, elaborate on that help us achieve those goals. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tanya. 
I think he covered most everything under mission statement. Um, our mission is, um, what is it, to promote professionalism and independent publishing. So like he said, uh, we try to, p it's really difficult to bring your work up to a professional standard without the support of editors and cover designers that are, are kind of credited in the industry as having a professional level. So we try to help people connect with good resources and we support each other in learning the marketing. Um, and, and we also, so we, we learn, we're learn, we help each other learn the marketing. It changes every day. It's very social uh, media driven. So there's always a new site. There's always a new method. And, um, like Adam was saying, we also have what we call the NIWA seal of quality. Um, we'll go into that more later, but it's this shiny gold silver sticker here. And we're crying to create a standard that says, this book has passed all of these tests and is of a professional quality. So previous to this seal, there hasn't been any way for independent authors to say, I am of a professional standard, so that's that's the seal. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll let you little know a little bit about how we got started. Um, wow, four years ago now, ten years ago, yeah, 2010. 2010, I, uh, the economy kind of went in the tank, as we all know. And uh, I got laid off of a job that I'd been at for about eight years, eight and a half years. It was a place I thought I was going to stay, I thought a place I thought I was going to retire from. Well, obviously things changed, and as we know, the kind of economy, especially in 2010, is there were no jobs out there to be had. I'd always been a writer most of my life, uh, in one way or another. I just never really attempted it seriously. I never thought about it seriously. It was just something I did because I enjoyed doing it. It was something I did for fun, basically. You know, or maybe I had an assignment in college, and so I had to write a story there, that kind of thing. Uh, but having all this time on my hand, I finally decided I was going to go ahead and sit down and do this. And it was kind of in conjunction with the same time that print-on-demand publishing was really starting to take off and starting to reshape the way the industry is looked at. Previously, my thoughts had been on self-publishing was that that was a vanity kind of thing. That's what you did as a vanity press is what it was commonly referred to. And that's how I thought of it. That's My, my mind was in that old school thinking that that was what people did who weren't good enough to make it. Well, I looked at my writing. I felt very confident about what I could do. I started shopping around, looking for agents, uh, looking for publishers, realizing just what a, what a huge, huge, huge effort it was just to do these things. And I started getting letters back. And the letters would always be, you know, we really like your writing. We think you're excellent. This just isn't what we're looking for right now. We, this story is not something we think is marketable, or this story is not something we handle. Maybe you should think about uh, submitting this to this agent or this publishing house. And I went around doing that for about six months or so. And, you know, I got good responses, but I really felt, you know, I was, in, I, I was probably a little impatient. I had a lot of time on my hands. I started doing a lot of research on publishing on demand, on print on demand, and realizing that, you know, things have changed, especially through Amazon CreateSpace. Things had really changed. There was, there, they, they actually had marketing set up. They had editors set up. They had all these things that could help you uh, get your book out there and present it as, as professionally as possible. So I said, what the heck, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to do this. I already had my first draft in, 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 done. It was finished. It was ready to go. I, I found an editor. Editor edited it. Felt really good. Got, got, did everything I needed to do. Got it together. Went through the process. Get my first box of books. And I thought, wow, what am I going to do now? I had not a clue. I did not know what I was going to do. I was online doing research left and right, trying to figure out the best thing to do. One of my friends suggested, well, you know, Oricon, which is a local science fiction convention that's held here every year, is coming up. You know, and I used to, as, as, as a younger man, used to go to Oricon a lot. And he says, why don't you try getting your book there? We get, get a table and just sell your book and see how it goes. And I thought, that's fantastic. So I uh, went ahead and I, I applied, you know, to get a table and found out I was way too late. My, my book had come out in, like, in October and the Oricon was in November. Leah Rush, who was in charge of the vendor's room at that time, got me in touch with Adam. Adam, also a self-published author, had a table there, and she thought, well, maybe we would like to share the cost of a table. Adam and, that, and I, at that time, were complete strangers. We did not know each other from Adam. <laughs> so uh, 
he was gracious enough to say, yeah, I'd share a table with you. You know, that, that sounds good. And so we, we met. Uh, <laughs> there's a funny story in that. but that, well, uh, So we met, got to know each other, uh, shared a table. He brought a friend there to help uh, with, with him over, you know, occupy the booth. I brought some friends. We all got along really, really well. We became kind of fast friends, actually, which was good, really good because I didn't know what we were getting into. Uh, but as I was there, and we were doing really well, Adam and I were selling quite a few books. But as I was there, I got up and I was wandering around, looking at the other vendors, looking at the other authors, and I realized there were a room full of independently published authors, all of them individually at their own tables, and all of them kind of in the same space when I talked to them about marketing, when I talked to them about what have you done, because I started asking questions. What have you done to market your book? What have you done to get your book out here, here? You know, d does this work for you? Does that work for you? And a lot of them didn't really have a lot of answers. And, and it really got me to thinking. So I had come back to the table at one point, or maybe I think it might have been over dinner we were talking about it. And I just mentioned, wouldn't it be great if we had some sort of resource, a group that we could pull all these independent authors together and, you know, and help each other with resources? And I just kind of said it in passing. And that was that. Con went. We went our separate ways. We kept in contact. I think it was probably February, the following February, that Adam basically got a hold of me and said, hey, let's do this thing. Let's get this going. And, I'm, and, we, and I was like, oh, really? Okay, let's do this. <laughs> so we had our first meeting. Uh, there were six founding members, uh, including Adam and myself. Uh, and when we got together, we just realized that we, we really had something here. We had, we had sort of a, a synergy going. We had a commitment to what we wanted to do. And we had a commitment to professionalism and what we did. We all believed in our works very strongly. We all felt that, that, that our works were good enough to be out there and be read and to be appreciated. So that's kind of how things got started. And from there, it's just been kind of a snowball. Um, so I think what we'll probably do right now is go ahead and uh, let Tanya speak a little bit about where NIWA is at right now, where it's going. Uh, we're going to speak about some of our programs that we have probably as well. Uh, I've talked to you a little bit about Oricon. We have some other programs that we do as well. Uh, but we'll go ahead and let Tanya get things started about where we're going, okay. as because I think that you know, as we know, Tanya has a bright future ahead of her. All right. So um, I met these guys at Oricon, and they talked me into this is not my fault. <laughs> um, all right. So. Um, where NIWA is going, where we're at now. So we're in the process of becoming an official association. I used to be in association management, so that's where I came in. Um, we laid in a structure, laid in a board, laid in chairs and directors and officers. Um, we're filling out the paperwork. Um, what we're trying to do is provide an infrastructure for the membership um, to provide support for um, the things that I mentioned previously, the book cover design, the book layout, editing, um, resources for that. Uh, we're putting together in February 1st and 2nd, and I have little flyers I can pass around, but um, we're putting on our first symposium. So it's our first educational conference. It'll be two days, and we are educating people about writing, marketing, and publishing. Um, we have found in our travels that a lot of independent authors kind of walk onto this stage blind, like we did. And um, yeah, it was fun. Um, and they don't understand that you do not need to pay someone $5,000 in order to put your book price at $22 for a paperback, which will never sell. Um, so. We're trying to educate people about pricing, about um, market cha channels, different ways that you can sell your books, different places you can sell your books, how to become an author entrepreneur, how to take ownership of your hobby as a business, um, how to run it as a business, what kind of paperwork you need to do, what kind of taxes you need to keep track of. You know, all of the stuff that people don't realize they're getting into when they walk in the door. They're like, I've always dreamed of writing, I have always loved books. I wrote a book. I Now what do I do? Well, they, they're always very surprised. <laughs> um, and then also, we, uh, we have kind of a, in addition to um, the professionalism in publishing, uh, independent publishing, we have sort of developed a little side, side wagon to our little motorcycle. We've got, um, we all do signings all year long. Farmers markets, stores, 
you know, you name it, we're everywhere. And um, the sort of tragic thing that you hear is the parents with their small children right here saying, I don't read. And, you know, as a mom, that kills me. <laughs> Like, no, 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 shh, shh, you might not read, but fake it. <laughs> um, so our side wagon is literacy. And at the symposium, we are going to have a literacy fundraiser where our authors are going to be there signing and selling their books. 20% um, will go to these, uh, the Hillsborough Library Foundation and the Right Brain Initiative, which brings the arts back into schools. I'm sure you've heard of it. And... Um, we will also be having raffles of all kinds of crazy gifts um, to also help raise money. But um, it's kind of our way of, of kind of fighting back against the whole reading's not cool, reading's, you know, tertiary to video games and movies and television. So, uh, and then I guess the third thing I will let Adam talk about, we are going to be putting on a writer's retreat. So symposium is about learning and education and answering all the questions all at once for the people that come into our group. And the first things they ask is, I got this book. What do I do with it? How do I market it? How do I sell it? Where do I sell it to? And the symposium is about educating them on, one, how to edit it correctly, publish it in a timely, professional manner, and then finding something to do with it. That's all fine and well. But it's, that's the work aspect, kind of, sort of, of the whole writing process. However, we want to have fun, too. And that's what we're planning on doing this next summer. We're going to hold at the Oregon Garden, which is kind of a uh, Napa Valley-esque location. We're going to have a get-together for people who want to write and do the creative, fun writing aspect of it. And no, no thinking, really, no work, just have fun and do let the creativity flow, and that's what our plan for the next summer is. And something we've come to find once we started asking people for money, because we started out as a club of friends, and we didn't really anticipate really making this into a money-making scheme or anything like that. I mean, we're still not making money, but, but the necessity of mailing stuff and paying fees for websites and every little thing that goes in, all the necessary evils for creating any kind of organization and moving forward with it requires money. And we got to the point, whether it's the registration fees for the symposium, registration fees for the writer's retreat, or what have you, we needed to start asking our members for money. And I was really hesitant to do that because in the minute we stopped being about just a community of people helping each other out and we put on the guys of even looking like we're trying to be profitable. I was worried that we're gonna scare people away. I was surprised to find that quite the opposite happened. We asked just a minimum $25 annual fee and we got more people signing up. And I guess that is a testament to how people feel passionate about this, how strongly they want to be a part of something that has got a stamp of legitimacy on it, I guess. So that's was a big surprise to me and a good indication that we're here, we're, we're just growing. Uh, Mike said it best when he said snowballing. We are snowballing. We went from a group of friends who decided to write one anthology together to we're on our third anthology. Our website now has all the different books that we put together over the years, we're creating a legacy. We've got a history behind us, so we're not going anywhere anytime soon. I think Mike is now going to talk to you a little about about um, the events that we do. Um, like I said, when we first started doing this, we asked ourselves, "What? How? Where am I going to sell my books?" And that's the like the number one thing that lots of people ask us when they join, and back when I started, I didn't have a clue and I was just sweating bullets. How am I gonna sell my book? Now, because in Iowa, I cannot, I cannot possibly attend all the different opportunities that come up, there's so many of them, because we, we network so much and we learn all the different opportunities out there and Mike's gonna talk a little bit about those. 
Thank you. As I spoke about earlier, we uh, we we all met kind of, kind of at Oricon, and that was really kind of our first big convention, and it still is our big convention that we do every year. Uh, it's kind of our flagship convention, and uh, we we launch an anthology as as Adam mentioned. We have an annual anthology of uh, the last three years have been speculative fiction. Could change in the future. I'm not sure. It kind of ties into what Oricon's all about. Uh, we have an annual launch party there at Oricon uh, where anyone can attend, and even if they're not going to the convention itself because it's in the hotel. Uh, and uh, But we've branched out from there. We, we attend several conventions, and we have members that kind of are in charge of each convention. I'm, I'm in charge of Oricon. Uh, we have other members that are in charge of individual conventions, and they kind of gather everything they together, they get people together, they make sure all the fees are paid, they make sure we have the proper setup for our booth, they make sure that we have all the books we need and and people are there to staff the booths, which is an incredible thing to do to watch this happen, going from Adam and I and a couple friends trying to staff a booth for three days to having so many people that we have too many people to staff a booth, which is fantastic we've uh we've done we do signings everywhere individually and together and i and we do we've done a lot of successful signings together we uh and we travel all over we go down to silverton regularly for the first fridays there um up in vancouver uh just anywhere in, in the portland metro area pretty much that we, we've hit we uh we recently did something very interesting. We had a member that came up with a suggestion, and this is what's great about this group, is that we always have suggestions. We always have members that have new and fresh ideas that I might not have thought of, Adam might not have thought of, somebody else in the group would not have thought of. Uh, our member brought up that her husband has a booth at the Home and Garden Show every year. She wanted us to get a booth there. Uh, my initial reaction, honestly, was the Home and Garden Show, we're not going to sell any books there. I was completely surprised. We had one of our most successful events to date until this last Oricon. Uh, it was one of our most successful events to date. We had quite a few authors there. Uh, we had quite a few titles there. People were stopping and people were buying books. It, it was it surprised me. But these are the kind of things that this group is good about, about coming up with fresh new approaches that you may not think of yourself. Um, Let's see. We uh, talked. To, Adam was talking a little bit about uh, 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 some of, some of the things that kind of connect us together, and we're talking about networking, and that's another great thing is that this is a great network, and you don't even need to physically actually attend the monthly meetings we have. We have people that are in Idaho at this point. We've got some people, members who we met at Orcon and live up in Seattle. They're interested in being here, and that's what we're trying to cover is everybody this entire Northwest area. Uh, to that effect, we do have our monthly meeting. Uh, and it's usually, in, it's been down, well, it's been, it's been, it's been off of uh, uh, McAdams Bar and Grill lately. Uh, but we've had it, sometimes we've had it down at, uh, in Hillsboro, sometimes we've had it up in Vancouver. We try to move it around quite frequently because we have members from all over the place and that way there's a chance that not everybody's always the one who has to drive at the furthest. Uh, but we have what's called our Google Forum and that's how we keep in a lot of main contact. Uh, across our Google forum, our members are constantly sharing their ideas, constantly keeping in touch, uh, asking questions, you know, asking for help, and that's one of the great networking solutions we have. Uh, we also have our Facebook page, of course, and our website. But I would say I think our, our our Google forum seems to really hit the most. That that's where we really share the most information, and we and we get the most accomplished together as a group. When aside from when we actually get together to do these these things outside, um, I think pretty much uh, I think that's pretty much about it for me here. I'm gonna hand you back over and let you guys talk a little bit about how to join up with NIMA, what's going on in that situation, uh, and, and 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 we have different levels as we say of membership. So people, some people do come to our Google forum and they kind of just kind of hang out there and check things out before they decide to to full on become full member, paid members. So let me hand you over to Adam and Tanya for that, and then I think uh, if you guys wrap, wrap wrap up, we'll probably open up for some questions. That sound good? All right. On our website, you can find just about every way to um, join us. We've got different levels of membership in that. One, you don't have to be a paid member at all. You can join for free on the Google discussion group and be what we call a lurker, someone who just hangs out and watches the different conversations and learn from that. And then you can throw in your own questions. And then if you want to participate, you become a paid member. And you don't have to be an author either. You can be a bookstore who wants to participate and be on the cutting edge of what's new and local. 
you can be a reader, and if you're a reader, you can uh, introduce yourself as a reader to the writer community and say, hey, I would love to read your books. And that reader will find himself having a thousand books being thrown at him for free, just so in the hopes that that reader will turn around and write them a review. And uh, that's about it as far as um, the community and all the different aspects you can be a part of. And being a part of this community opens a lot of doors at the different conventions that we participate in. It used to be that when we first started out that we couldn't get our foot in the door to participate in the, um, the, no, the, when you're speaking as a panel member on, a panelist. panelist. <laughs> <laughs> <He's a writer>. <laughs> <laughs> Two syllables. <laughs> Well, to be a panelist at a convention, you had to have know somebody who knows somebody, and it'd be, it's a big deal to be on one of the panels. And we were rejected like year after year until recently. Now we've got two, three people at the last convention. We're probably going to have a couple more at the next convention coming up, and that wasn't the case in the past. And in bookstores, were kind of hesitant and accepting an indie author who walks in with their own book and said, hey, could you put this on the shelf? But once now that they were, oh, you're a NIWA member, no problem. They'll put you right on the shelf. And that's happened quite often. So it's opened some doors for us, our community. And uh, Tanya is going to talk to you about how to go about joining. I actually have a couple of things if I don't forget them. <laughs> um, so joining, we have membership applications here. We have a mailing list which puts you on the reader list if you like to talk to authors and get free books. Um, we, You can do that all on our website, niwawriters.com. Um, there was a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. I'm already forgetting one of them, so I'll just focus on the other. <laughs> we have a kind of program. So this goes with the literacy thing I spoke of earlier. We have um, kind of a writers made a king readers program and we have done a couple of what we call author speed dates. It sounds really sexy. I got asked a couple times, but aren't you married? <laughs> like, yes, it's not about that. <laughs> um, it, it Basically, there's a room full of authors, like 30 authors, and you go around and you can ask them all your questions about the book that's always been in your head or the book that maybe is finished and what do I do with it now? Or even if you're not wanting to write, you can ask them, you know, like, where do you get your ideas? You know, how do you come up with this stuff? You know, do you have anything that you could recommend that is similar to your work that, that inspired you? So it's fun. And we, uh, we just try to make um, books more exciting, more fun for um, local kids and adults. And um, we have also done some speaking at local schools. My son is in third grade and has a picture book out. I know you're shocked. Um, <laughs> but he goes around to the classrooms and he reads this to the kids. And it has a really profound effect. Because for little kids, writing is a grown-up thing. And it's inaccessible to them. It's untouchable. And they cannot really ever do it. They can only play at it. And this, we get kids walking up to us all the time going, I read your book, it's so cool. I have a book, I'm gonna work on it. How do I do this, blah, blah, blah. And the parents come up and the teachers have this whole classroom of kids that are suddenly really excited about the arts and really excited about writing. So it kind of, it makes it less adult, more accessible to them because anybody can write a book, you just have to practice. Actually, to, to really quick before you get take any questions, to touch on, on something that both Tanya and Adam just kind of brought up is that as independent authors, I, we are very much part of the community, and I and we and we very much support many things in the community and many and when it comes to literacy, when it comes to the arts in general. Also, we, bards and brews—that's what I was about to bring up. Uh, <laughs> Primrose and tumbleweed off of uh, West Main Street in Hillsboro. Uh, we do a once a month reading there with uh, not only authors from us, but other authors that come in, uh, not just from Nava, but other authors. Uh, and it's a very, very, very nice event. It's a it's a nice restaurant. People that own it are fantastic, and they and they help and they put that on in conjunction with Jacobson's Books in Hillsboro as well. Uh, so if, if if and that's the. Last Friday of every month, uh, 
Ian, it's just a great, it's great atmosphere. Uh, the readings are always good. We always have a diverse group of authors, uh, and you'll get every, in, in a night you'll have four or five different authors, and they'll always be, they'll, they'll always have different subject matter to talk to, talk about. Uh, but bringing that back to the commu uh, community and the supportive community, we have found some great independent uh, bookstores, booksellers that have worked with us over, over this last few years. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Jacobson's Books uh, is, is one of them uh, down in this area. Jan's Paperbacks down in this area has helped us out. Up in Vancouver, we have Vintage Books and Interstellar Overdrive helped us up. Uh, and, and a lot of these bookstores, uh, and I can especially speak to Vintage Books up in Vancouver because I was going in as a kid this tall when, that, when, when Becky first opened that store. And she's been there since I was that tall. I'm 45 now. So, and she has been a part of that community, and something that I think that we we have forgotten a little bit as we're as we're as we're kind of moving further and further into the 21st century, downloadable books are becoming more popular. Are just are just even ordering paperbacks on online are becoming more popular. You've seen a lot of the big big name box stores close down, uh, Barnes and Noble being the only real one left in town. Uh, but these little indie booksellers are still out there. Every single one of them are out there. And they really need your support, and they need our support as writers. And, and they, they, they keep something alive that I think is never going to truly die, and that's the, the independent spirit of art and the community spirit of art. And so that's one point I kind of wanted to touch on. Uh, shall we do questions? Or? Sure. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thanks for coming in today. Thank I'm, you. Uh, I'm excited to hear about your organization. I had two quick questions. Uh, uh, the first question is, is, do you have a relationship with the Willamette Writers, and if so, what? And the second question is, is if a uh, Viking Penguin came to you and wanted to publish your next book, would you do that, or would you proceed on in the, in the, the way you've been doing? Uh, to answer the first question, yes, we have a cordial relationship with uh, Willamette Writers, but not a professional one. Uh, we, we are, now we've obviously, we've been to a lot of the same events at the same time. We know some of the same members, uh, we, and we do cross paths. And we have members in our group who are also members of Willamette Writers Association as well. So uh, that does cross over. I can speak for myself if anybody's going to offer me a contract. No, no, I, I, I would definitely not turn that down. I, I you know, I, I enjoy writing. I you know, I'm not, I, I sell well enough right now to, 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 to help supplement my income. I want to make a, a full-time living writing. That's what I want to do. That's, that's been my dream for a long time. Uh, so I have, no, I have no qualms against the big houses. I obviously have no qualms about anybody who, who wants to go that route. I just think that in this day and age, you have to do everything you can to get your word out there as far as being a storyteller. And that's kind of when, when that, that's the greatest thing about what we're doing right now is that gets me out there. Someday I could, you know, who knows? It would be great to be the next Stephen King. Even if I don't make that kind of money, I, I want to make a living doing this. Even, I just, just be comfortable, be fine with me, because I am passionate about what I do. I enjoy what I do. And, that, and that's, that, that's to me what it's about, is being a passion about what you do and just, and just having that love of the written word and, write, and just reading in general and everything that has to do with, with fiction, nonfiction. I mean, I'm an avid reader. I will read anything you put in front of me. <laughs> so, but I, that's what I consider that. I, uh, but hey, what do you think about that? I have very mixed feelings. <laughs> um, it seems to me that, I mean, he always says things much more beautifully, which is why we brought him. <laughs> uh, for me, the hybrid career is kind of the pinnacle right now. Being fully traditionally published means you lose control of your work and your career. However, it is a huge um, distribution powerhouse that you will never have as an independent author. And if you look at the statistics for last year, uh, traditionally published writers made less than hybrid careers. Hybrid careers are people who publish a few of their books through traditional houses and publish the rest of them independently. So they are leveraging that um, audience that is built by the traditional house uh, to market their books, which they actually make money off of. Because you have to understand that traditional houses give you about 25 cents a book. That, whereas if you are publishing it yourself, now understand there is also a lot of overhead 
you are responsible for your own marketing, whether you go traditional or, or uh, indie. So that's not different. But you probably make about six bucks a book when you sell um, independent. And, and on that on that point too, actually, we have several writers in our group, and myself included. I've had professional sales. We have uh, we have several writers in the group who are both, and that is that hybrid uh, authorship that that Tanya is speaking of. I think what it really comes down to is what kind of deal are they offering you? If they offer you a very good deal, you're not going to turn it down, regardless of what your personal thoughts are on the industries. But if they offer you a deal that's really not much different in what you're already doing for yourself, marketing-wise, uh, big publishers these days, because of the economy, just because of the way the industry is going, they've cut back so much on their staffs that they're requiring the authors do more and more of the work. And if I'm doing that anyway, and I'm going to make myself six bucks versus 35 cents per book sold, why would I? But then again, they got this huge, huge distribution channels that has a farther reach and so you have to kind of weigh one versus the other and it it just it depends on the contract and you might decide to take a not so good situation and do it anyway because that's a start your next book and your book after that you can get a better and better deal with a traditional publisher and it, it just depends so I guess in a nutshell it depends <laughs> go ahead sir Thank you, Phil uh, Nelson, forum member. I'm just curious now if you could explain a little bit about print on demand and how perhaps that varies with or is different from offset and e publishing. Uh, and what are we talking about in those two methods, print on demand and e publishing, and the marketing perhaps of, of each of those, if you would? Thank you. Sure. Um, Publish on demand is about uh, printed books and the technology. It used to be that if a publisher was going to print your book, they had to print a minimum of 15,000 or something like that just because the physical technology required, you could only spit out so much at a certain speed and it was not economical to print only 100 books or 200. It had to be a huge amount. But with nowadays, the technology with print on demand is essentially a printer, like at your home, a little bit bigger and more high tech with better ink and all that, and the binding that goes with it. They can literally print out one book at a time and it's economical. That is print on demand. And that's what uh, Amazon does for us as indie authors, we provide them our files, our digital, and then when somebody clicks on your book on Amazon to buy it, they print it right there on the spot after that sale has been made, and they ship it right there on the spot to that customer. And it's economical. Way back when, that was not possible, but today it is, and that's print on demand. E-publishing is, is digital books on your iPad, your Kindle, your computer, it's, there's no physical book, it's all the digital file text on an e-reading device. And as far as marketing goes for that, it's pretty much all the same. It's a book is a book is a book, whether it's digital or physical, and getting the word out about it is pretty much the same. Um, I'm sure I'll let Mike and Tawny elaborate on that. As far as marketing books goes, there is no really wrong or right answer, to be honest. And that's one of the great things about having our group is there's so many different people you could talk to about how they did things. Um, some some things work for other people. Uh, one, there, there are people who will pay for reviews and Kirkus Reviews, which does paid reviews. And that could be beneficial, or you could spend that money and have that not be beneficial to you at all. I believe in the power of reviews. It's helped me a lot. I was lucky enough to get a hold of uh, have a reviewer who really loved my books a lot, and then uh, and then find out that she actually does reviews for five different websites, which I didn't know until she started reviewing my books, and I started seeing sales go up. So uh, there's 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 that uh, there's you know your internet presence. We have book trailers nowadays, which is like a movie trailer, but it's about your book, and it can be anywhere from you know sixty seconds to two minutes, and tells the story. You know, gives it hooks the readers to want to come see your read your book like they want to go see a movie. Um, 
yeah, there's so many different ways to market, and there are so many different things, and not everything works for the same person. You know, I talked to one guy and said, oh, I did this, and this worked for me great, and I try it, and it doesn't work. It's 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 kind of a it's kind of a hit miss mystery, and that's part of what we're helping solve together to find that working thing that's going to work for everybody, or at least as best as it can. So, uh, you know, I think obviously Adam pretty much hit and you know, told uh, print on demand and, and electronic publishing pretty thoroughly. So, uh, one thing about our online forum, uh, when people try, so there is a massive amount of people out there independently publishing right now. You cannot even begin to imagine. Um, it's really exploded. And so pretty much you have to be on the cutting edge of any new marketing tool that comes up. You have to be a first adopter, wherein that used to be very poor decision making. <laughs> um, yeah, now you have to be a first adopter. And the nice thing about our forum is one, you hear about those things, and two, People, other members provide their statistics, and you know their genre because you've been on there. So you can kind of get a feel for what's effective and what's not effective, and um, it's just it's been a really good informational tool. But definitely one of the best things you can have marketing is to have that professional product, and that means cover design, looking like you want to put your book, take your book off that bookshelf, hold it next to Stephen King's, and not tell that it was done by anybody but the same publishing house. And that's one of the biggest things is book design and, and, and your look and the way you present yourself and the way you present your work, and, and interior-wise as well, too. Um, and, and to touch on that point, there are a lot of people out there self-publishing, and those are all those people that made it that much harder to get published on, on through traditional publishing because there were so many authors out there that the traditional public house, publishing houses <laughs> couldn't print them all so so it's kind of a it's kind of a catch-22 <laughs> so sir chris leslie forum member i want to thank you i wish you all good luck in your future careers and writing this is a well in a way a thrill because you're going to sign those free samples back there aren't you <laughs> no they have books on the back table. <clears throat> there are some books on the back table from those of us who weren't rushing out of the house at the last minute. <laughs> uh, I have questions. Uh, one about copyrights. Do you uh, have much trouble with people copywriting different ideas? I mean, Shakespeare probably copy, uh, stole the copyrights from uh, Aesop, so... Uh, no, I've never really come across that problem at all. I mean, you know, it, the, the copyright laws in America are, are, are pretty stringent and pretty easy to defend your work if you ever have an issue with that. I have not seen that as an issue. Uh, my, 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 well, I'm sorry, go ahead. With your members, do you sort of check each other? Uh, no, I don't think we've really had to, honestly. No, uh, in, not, not, not that I've seen. Uh, yeah, I don't think copyright has ever been an issue. I mean, I've never really worried. Things are things have changed so much because of electronic publishing, especially. Is okay. that you know, yes, there is that danger that you have to be careful, but pretty much since day one, I have, you know, I mean, you have a computer record of what you what you've written, so you know when you wrote that there was a log right. of when it was created. If there was ever ever an issue, you can always go back to look and say, hey, this is when this this document was filed. I always email myself all of my writings. So to my own email, and then I just keep it in a folder. That's another way to kind of date it, if so if there's any problem. But it's never really been something I've really been super concerned about. It. I don't know about you guys. Uh, no, like Mike says, there's always, especially in this day and age, there is a uh, trail of documentation. Even from the point on Amazon, it says published on date. And there's a, just too much information to prove that your book is your book. And it's kind of a myth that you have to have, it's required to have a copyright from a Library of Congress, and that's just not true because uh, art work is something that automatically has its own copyright just from its existence. Today it's published or printed. Yeah. Right. Yeah, even from the point of creation, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. From six members, how many members? Oh, go ahead. Just super fast, um, an anecdotally, I would get my copyright certificate. It will save you a massive amount of legal fees. You just show Amazon your certificate and it's over versus you having to hire a lawyer and demonstrate all of those little particulars. Um, and as far as using other people's work in your work, 
it's super easy now. You just go online, you fill out the form at Penguin and say, I would like to quote this section. And they say, go ahead, it's short enough. Or they say, it's very long, you can pay us this much. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty simple. And you'd be surprised how much stuff is actually in the public domain now. I mean, things that shock me sometimes. And I'm like, whoa, that's in public domain? You start out with a group of six. How many are you now? What's our official paid membership now? We're over 100 pa official paid members. Uh, and then we have, of course, what, you know, we go, the lurkers that on, on Google and their lurkers on Facebook. And some of them always, they'll say, oh, I'm a member of NIWA. So, you know, I'm not going to say, no, you're not. Okay. <laughs> so. And this is all fiction or non do you have nonfiction? We, we have both. Uh, we've really branched out. I mean, we started, the core writers started off as speculative fiction, which is horror, fantasy, science fiction, that kind of thing. Uh, but now we have children's authors. We have nonfiction authors now. And that's, and we're kind of, we're, 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 that's what, we, what we've been hoping to do, because we want to be able to help those people out, branch out and do their own thing. Like hope, you know, if there's a romance convention coming up, our romance authors can go, go do that, and we can help them get set up for that kind of thing. So, yeah. I went to the romance convention. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> I have more, but I let well, yield the lead. Well, thank you for your questions. We appreciate it. You'll be next after me. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Lee Coleman, uh, forum member. Uh, coming with a rich history, I spent about 30 years writing for two different law book co companies and um, got a couple of successful authors in the family. Valerie Plame being probably cool. the best known. Uh, now, I'm just sort of getting a feel for the concept. Um, my, would you say that the organization is now in a position to be an agent for independent writers for magazine articles, for example? Not necessarily books, but uh, articles. In, in our very, very, very beginnings, in our very, very early beginnings, we had discussed, you know, what the limitations of what we were going to do is going to be. Uh, we'd actually discussed, do we ever want to be a publishing house ourselves? You know, do we want to do those kind of things? I'd say, that, not to say that's not something that could happen in the future, but that's not something that, that we're really directed at at this time. Okay. Well, thanks. All right. Thank you. You're nice. <laughs> Chris Leslie, four member again. The idea of uh, checking off what you sign when you sign the comment uh, rights on the internet, when you sign uh, check that and say it's okay, you've read all this stuff. I can't read all that stuff. <laughs> what do I lose when I sign that to uh, make a comment on, say, business or uh, social or the Oregonian live? I, <laughs> you don't read it either. <laughs> yeah, I really have no idea either, to be honest with you. In, in this day and age, I have to say, we I don't think there's anybody in this room who hasn't been on a computer that has said, uh, do you agree with these terms? Yes, I do, <laughs> without reading them. <laughs> I know. You, they never seem to really tell you what you're losing. They never really seem to make any sense <laughs> because we're not all lawyers. <laughs> oh, right. Thank God. Well, no. No, no. <laughs> don't, get, don't get Lee riled up. I, I'm the atheist in the group anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but, okay. Next questioner, I yield. Thank you, sir. John McWilliams, a forum member, and I want to thank you for being here. Uh, this is a really uh, topic of interest to me. Um, I have a friend who's uh, up in the Matanuska Valley, uh, Anchorage, and, and he's in a he has a writers guild up there, and he's very involved in. Uh, but uh, I want to get to the nitty gritty part of uh, writing. And uh, so, do you have an idea and you just write it, and next thing you know, you have a book? Or do you uh, actually have a whole bunch of people that you go through, uh, read it, and criticize, and all those kind of things? Or how do you go about writing a book? Well, the process is different for everybody when it comes to writing. It really is. Uh, I know Adam is a very detailed uh, outliner. He makes a lot of detailed outlines. 
I'm kind of a circle circle cloud kind of thinker, you know, where I, I have a lot of ideas and I'll, oh, I'll, I'll be circling this, and I'll be circling that, and I'll, I'll be crossing stuff off as I get to it in the story, and I'll be thinking it in my head as I'm writing. Uh, so I think the process is different for everybody. Everybody has a different process. As far as once you get to that point where you have that first draft done, the best thing to do that you can do is find somebody you completely trust, you know, and who's going to give you an honest opinion. I'm not talking about handing it off to cousin Bob or your mom or whoever who's going to love what you do no matter what you do, but give it to somebody whose opinion you trust, who you know is going to give you an honest, honest answer, just to get feedback from them on that. If you have somebody that happens to be an English major, that's even better. You know, hand, you know, hand, if someone is real well qualified, that's even better. And you need an editor. You need an editor, plain and simple. I mean, you have to have an editor. Um, Ed? Yeah, if you know somebody like that who's completely qualified and willing to do it for free, good job. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah. What does that word mean? <laughs> As for myself, I really want the professionalism and the objectivity. I've got a great relationship with a freelance editor who's got a great pedigree and I'm not a personal friend of mine. I got a good relationship with her, but not a good, or not a prof personal friend. And so when she gives me feedback, I know that it's true and honest. And as much as it hurts, I do her suggestions and I got a better product for it. And then when I got that done, I give it to uh, beta readers to make sure every single little thing has been caught spelling and grammar wise. And I do that before and after my editor, but um, I make sure that that profile, that protocol has been followed to get the best possible product. Thank you. Good luck in your books. Thank you. Yeah, definitely edit, 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 edit. I was a writing teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the biggest thing that held me back from launching my career 10 years ago is the fact that I did not ever have a class where they really explained the function of every single part of a book. And I think that not knowing that made sections of the book very boring, and I could not understand why. So I studied that. I do outline ahead of time. It never looks the same when I'm finished, so that's fair enough. But um, I always tell my students, um, even if you can't afford a professional editor, because that can go upwards of two or three thousand dollars, if you consider the fact that they're editing probably about 500 pages of text, it's violent. But um, I use six editors. Two are technical. One is a psych, psych person, a head shrinker. The other one is a technology person. My husband does edit my books, and we fight like cats and dogs. But he is a non-native speaker, and do you know why that is really helpful? He reads every word. The rest of us native speakers, we don't read every word on the page. We're looking at the shapes of the words, and then we just go right on. Um, and we fill in whatever's missing, and it's all fine. He's, he reads every word. So he is like, oh, you left out the. Oh, you left out Anne. You know, he gets it all. Um, and then I have uh, three um, very good writers who also edit my stuff. So my mine goes through six people. That's a lot of time. It is also a profound level of depression to be beat on <laughs> for that long. <laughs> but um, you know, you get over it eventually. Uh, yeah, and definitely going back to the school thing, that if you are thinking about getting into writing and you haven't really done a lot of writing, or even if you have done a lot of writing, taking a fiction writing class can really open your mind and, and, and really expand your talents. There's a, there's a lot of different ways to think about writing, I think. Uh, some people think of it as a purely artistic endeavor. Some people, such as myself, think of it as craft. It's something that you can learn from. Your work is never perfect. It can always be improved on, and you can always grow as a writer. You can become better. The more you write, the better you're going to get. Uh, I, had a, I had a teacher, uh, Dr. Rita Carey, of a Clark College. I took her first, her first basic class or advanced class, and I was so into it, she created a third individual class just for me because I was just so excited about what she did. But I learned so much from her that I just didn't know because I was just raw. And she taught me how to kind of take that rawness and, and, and work it to hone it. So I, I would like to actually, yeah. there's a really great anecdote. Um, I think it was Larry Brooks. He said, OK, so like, how many of you like to golf? You know, how many of you think you could you know, go from where you are right now and go become professional golfers. 
You know, nobody raises their hand on the second one, right? You know, like that's a lifetime of like meticulous dedication to you know form and science. Well, like so many people walk on to the writing stage and say, "I read a book. I can write a book." It's like, no, 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 no. That is years of mastery. That is study. That is practice. I tell my students, "Don't write your baby first. It's gonna be ugly. You're learning. Let yourself learn." You got an ugly baby, yeah. But let yourself learn. Give yourself permission to learn. Hi, I'm Sylvia Dobbs, member. Coincidentally, you pretty much answered the questions I was going to ask, <laughs> but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, what were your educational focuses? Uh, was it journalism, uh, English majors, or uh, what? Also, uh, do you have a particular reference for uh, English usage when you're writing? You, you use editors quite a bit, but do you have some good sources that for your own? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say for me personally, I'm a little, I'm a little bit of an outlaw, a little bit of a rebel when it comes to that kind of thing. Uh, I'm not gonna say that I, you know, I, I obviously I, I did well in English in school. Now to this day, I still can't define the eight parts of speech. I will dangle a participle. I will do everything I'm not supposed to do when I'm writing because when I'm writing, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not focused on that event. That's what ed that's what the editing process is. So, for me. I really don't have a lot of resource materials sitting around in front of me when I'm writing. If I do, that gets in my way. It stops the flow of the creativity. I go back later on, and I actually, you know, and I use all, you know, standard resources pretty much. Uh, but and if there's anything I missed, you know, I, the editor picks it up. Uh, I I did come from that was my uh, English major in college, so, I, but it's really weird because I just don't I don't approach writing that way. It's it, now if I'm right, doing technical writing, yes, that's a completely different thing. But as far as writing fiction goes, I really have to keep an open mind, open process. I can't edit while I'm writing, and I, and that's something I actually did learn from my teacher, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carey, is not to be an editor while you're writing. You have to you have to shut that part of your brain off, and it has to come from a creative, purely creative source. But that's just me. So I mean, everybody has different ways they go about doing things. So I'm actually a chemist. Writing, I did not go to school for. I went, got a BA in chemistry and business and some French. Uh, so I really did not intend on being a writer, and it just kind of worked out that way after I realized in the working world, I hate chemistry, I hate my job. <laughs> and uh, so I'm in between jobs, day jobs now, and I'm just focusing on the fun and the love and the passion of writing. And I like Mike, I never really focused or cared on the English or the grammar and the spelling. I was always okay at it as a student, but never occurred to me to memorize what are the eight parts of speech. And my writing style is purely uh, imitation of all the books I've ever read. And my spelling and grammar was okay to begin with. And um, I'm very slow and meticulous about my writing. Like these guys, I don't know how they do it. They write a whole bunch, and then they go back and edit it. Like, oh, I don't like this chapter. I'm going to start all over with this chapter. I'm like, what? I can't do that. I write a few sentences, don't like it, back up, fix it right there on the spot, then continue. And then when I'm done, I got a complete, pretty much done book. I don't go back to anything. Going back is alien to me, I don't understand. I just make it right the first time, as much as possible, and then let my editor beat me up over the fact that this character has got black hair. In this scene, when a few chapters back, the hair is blonde. And that's the kind of thing is that my editor mostly f has to fix for me, not so much the grammar. And um, that's how I go about it. How about you, Tanya? And that definitely goes back to the process being different for everybody. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely nothing like either one of these guys. <laughs> I, so, like, early on, I was very much a disciple of the whole writing comes from on high, it's channeled through you, and it's this brilliant spark from the muse, and blah, 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 blah. So I'm very much more academic about it now, I will confess. I um, do not appreciate spending two to three years re redoing everything about a manuscript because I flew through it by the seat of my pants. Um, I do have grammar resources. I love Grammar Girl online. She is awesome. If you look her up, she's great. Um, I, I write with my best friend sitting on my shoulder. She's a professional editor. <laughs> she's violent. <laughs> 
So yeah, I pay I pay attention to what I'm doing, and and not only from a structural perspective, but from from a, a sentence structure perspective as well, and language usage perspective. Because I always thought that if I just dashed it down and just got it all on paper, that when I went back, I would um, be able to dress it up. And like when I was younger, that was great. And now that I am like the mother of two children and always sleep deprived and always like, oh my gosh, is this done yet? I don't have time for that and I don't have the mental capacity for it. I will pick that thing up, I will start to read it and pretty soon I am not seeing a single word that is on that page. I am completely blind to it. So I am definitely um, moving back towards the get it right the first time or it will never be right. Um, and my, my education is English literature, philosophy, and foreign languages. And uh, yeah, so I have been writing books since I was four. So I have been practicing a very long time. And do not let this man undercut himself. He works like a dog. <laughs> he might be from the chemistry background, but he works harder at this craft than most of the rest of us. And like I said, I think that definitely comes down to the process and what you're doing. And, and it definitely tells some people, it, since it's a craft, some people are more natural storytellers than others, and some people have to craft the story a little bit more than others. It, it really just kind of depends on, 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 on how you approach things. One thing I wanted to, because we were talking, because talking about time and discipline, the one thing that I really feel, honestly, at any writer at any level, you know, any level of your professional beginning to, to best selling is, it's all about discipline because none of us have time anymore in our days and our lives. It's just, we just don't. We just, we're busy. We're all busy. You talk to everybody all the time. They're always busy. And so it's about the discipline of doing things. And, and Adam's very disciplined. You, you heard the outline. That's, a, that's part of his discipline. That's part of how he gets things done. You know, and it's not, me, it's just about carving out, just saying, okay, I'm going to write from this time to this time every, on these days. And I have to stick with that. And I stick with those days. And I write those days. And those are the days I write. And then I say, oh, on these days, I'm going to do editing. Or on these days, I'm going to do promotion. So yeah, so it's definitely di discipline is, like, is, 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 is a huge part of this. Pat's got your last question. OK. Thank you. Yes, Pat Mayberry, a board member. Thank you for joining us today. The copyright documentation, is that issued by the Library of Congress? I've never gone down that path to find out. Uh, the one, once I realized after doing research online that that's something you really don't need to do, uh, Tanya might disagree with me, but I've never ever heard once of it actually being an issue with anybody that you had to have it. And it's a good thing to have eventually, but it's nothing I've had to do just yet, and that's all I know about it. And by the way, these disagreements, this is what makes us such a great group together, is that we don't all pat each other on the back and say, oh, it's like this. Oh, you're sure it's like that, Mike? No, no, no. That's, this is what makes us, this thing work so well. It's very simple. It's an online form. You fill everything out. You send them two copies of your book, and you get your certificate in the mail. It's, it's super easy. You keep your certificate in your safety deposit box. It's kind of like insurance. Different people have different philosophies about how much you might need. I have uh, long-term health care insurance. <laughs> no, my awesome. question truly is the documentation that you do receive from the Library of Congress, is that also considered by some people your copyright documentation verification? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out today. We do appreciate it, and uh, we're glad to be here, and uh, we're glad to answer your questions. Thanks, folks. We really appreciate you being here. I'd like to uh, connect the dots. Next week, we have a rock star in the library world. That's Doug Hoy. You want to wave so everybody knows who you are? Uh, I'd like uh, my speakers up here today. Make sure you connect with him. Uh, the Aloha Community Library Association has a partnership with this organization. They've uh, donated their video camera, and that's saved us a, a substantial amount of money. It's helped us keep our expenses low, and it is a, a natural segue to uh, uh, having the Aloha Community Library uh, present next week. On Martin Luther King Day, we have the organization where I met NIWA, the Westside Cultural Alliance. And uh, so there, that's January 20th. I'd highly recommend uh, uh, visiting the forum for that. So with that being said, I'd like to conclude today's forum. Thanks for being here and come back next week for the library. Bye-bye.